In this short meeting, we're going to talk about higher order partial derivatives, which means second order, third order, and so on. And as a bonus, we're going to talk about PDEs, partial differential equations. So if you have a function of two variables and it has first order partial derivatives, well, those partial derivatives are actually functions as well. And so it would make sense that we could take the partial derivative of f sub x, for example. And the way we would write that is, well, that would be f sub x sub x again. So we just write it as two subscripts x followed by x. In the Leibniz notation, we'd have the partial squared f over partial x squared. We could also take the partial derivative with respect to y of f of x, and that would give us f sub x y. So we had f sub x, then sub y, so we just append a y to the subscript. Now in Leibniz notation, we're taking the partial with respect to y of the partial of f with respect to x, and so to help us with the notation, we would like to think about considering these as almost like a fraction. And that's why we would get partial squared f over partial y, then partial x. So we really have to be careful here with the different notation because the subscript notation, which I think almost everybody prefers, it's simpler to write, and it also makes sense that uh, uh, as you read left to right, that's the order in which the derivatives were taken. You first took the derivative with respect to x, then the derivative with respect to y. With the Leibniz notation, you have to read it from right to left. You first took a derivative with respect to x, then took the derivative with respect to y. We could also take the first partials of the f sub y, or the partial of f with respect to y. And so then uh, I would get in the subscript notation f sub y x, or if I'm taking the partial with respect to x of the partial of f with respect to y, and I'll get partial squared f over partial x, partial y again. The order is reversed from the subscript notation. And then finally, taking the partial with respect to y of f sub y gives me f y y or partial squared f over partial y squared. So notice that we've got four partial derivatives, second order partial derivatives when you have a function of two variables. And because there's two variables, then the number of uh, partial derivatives is going to increase geometrically with the order of the derivatives. So there's two first order partial derivatives, four second order partial derivatives, eight third order partial derivatives, 16 fourth order partial derivatives, and so on. We are always taking the partial derivative with respect to the same variable that gives you a repeated partial. And where you changed, that would give you a mixed partial. So we want to find all second order partial derivatives of the function f of x comma y equals x cubed plus x squared y cubed minus 2y squared. So we're asked to find all of them. That means all four, both the repeated and the mixed or partial derivatives. So let's start with the first order partial derivatives. There's no uh, challenge here. It's just using the power rule and remembering when I'm taking the partial derivative with respect to x, negative 2y squared 
is just a function of y only. So it's only a constant as far as taking the partial derivative with respect to x. So uh, its partial derivative is going to be 0. And taking the partial derivative with respect to y, our first term is a function of x only. So when taking the partial derivative with respect to y, we would treat that as a constant, and its partial derivative would be 0. So taking the first repeated partial derivative, taking the partial with respect to x of f sub x, just use the power rule. I'll have uh, 6x plus 2y cubed. Remember the 2y cubed is considered a multiplicative constant times x, and the partial of x with respect to x is just 1. When I take the partial with respect to y of f sub x, the first term is a function of x only. So its derivative will be 0. And then I just use the power rule on the second term. Looking at the partial with respect to y, if I take the partial with respect to x of f sub y, my second term, minus 4y, is a function of y only. So its partial derivative is 0, and I just use the power rule on the first term. And finally, the repeated partial with respect to y. Both of these terms are functions of y, so I'll use the power rule on each one. Now, notice that the repeated partials are very different, but the mixed partials are identical. And I wonder, is that something peculiar to this particular problem? It's a rather simple problem, just a polynomial. Or is that always going to be true? Well, we have a theorem about that from Clairaut. Clairaut's theorem says that if you have a function which is defined in a disk that contains your point a comma b, so your disk in the xy plane, a comma b doesn't have to be the center of the disk. And if your mixed partials are both continuous throughout the disk, so we have that continuity requirement, then the mixed partials will be equal to each other at any point in the disk. So what we need is continuous second order partial derivatives. And that's almost always going to be the case. So here's an example. Let's show that this uh, statement is true for the function g of x comma y equals sine of x squared minus y squared. So the first partial with respect to x, well, I'll have to use the chain rule with all of these partial derivatives. Derivative of sine is just cosine. Then I'll have to take the partial with respect to x of the inside, which is the partial with respect to x of x squared minus y squared. That will just be 2x. So let me multiply the in front by 2x. So now, we're interested in the mixed partials, and so I'll be taking the partial with respect to y of g of x, and that makes it pretty simple because now 2x is just considered a constant. I have a multiplicative constant times cosine of x squared minus y squared, so there's no need to use the product rule. I will need to use the chain rule. Derivative of cosine will give me negative sine. That's why I have negative 2x now. And I'll have to multiply that by the partial with respect to y of x squared minus y squared. Now that'll give me a negative 2y. And I'll multiply that times negative 2x to get positive 4x. 
Let's look at the first partial with respect to y. Again, the derivative of sine is cosine. Just have to be careful when I'm applying the chain rule because now I'm taking the partial with respect to y. So the partial with respect to y of x squared minus y squared will give me negative 2y. And I'll put that out in front as a multiplier. And because now I'm going to take the partial derivative with respect to x. So again, the negative 2y, I consider that as a multiplying constant. And uh, I just need to use the chain rule. No need for the product rule. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine. That's why the negative sign now is gone. I just have 2y sine of x squared minus y squared. But I need to multiply that by the partial with respect to x of x squared minus y squared, because I need to use the chain rule. Well, that partial of x squared minus y squared will be 2x. 2x times 2y will give me positive 4y. And sure enough, I got the same thing for each mixed partial derivative. So let's look at some even higher order derivatives. Let's look at a third order derivative and fourth order derivative of f of x comma y equals cosine of 2x plus 3y. So again, remembering with the indices, I'm reading the order from left to right, but with the Leibniz notation, the order goes from right to left. So here I know I'm going to start by taking the derivative with respect to x, then the derivative with respect to x again, and finally the partial derivative with respect to y. So to emphasize that, I could think of this as being the partial derivative with respect to y of this repeated uh, second partial derivative. And then here I've unwound this almost completely. Uh, and just to emphasize, well, why, why do we have that order? Because we think of this as being like a multiplication. The notation suggests a multiplication. If I start with the partial with respect to x, then take the partial with respect to x again, I get the, and then the partial with respect to y, then the partial with respect to y. So that's the reason why that order is read from uh, right to left. OK, so let's start with our partial with respect to x. Uh, derivative of cosine is negative sine. Applying the chain rule, I'll have to multiply that by 2. Let's take the derivative with respect to x again. Derivative of sine is positive cosine, so I still have a negative 2 out here. Still taking the partial of the inside with respect to x, so I get another multiplier of 2. So negative 4 cosine of 2x plus 3y. Finally, take the partial with respect to y. Derivative of cosine is negative sine, so now the negative becomes a positive. And now I'm taking the partial of the inside with respect to y, which will give me a multiplier of 3. So I get 12 sine of 2x plus 3y. In part b, remember we're going to start with the partial with respect to x, which, oh, same thing we did over there. Okay, good thing we got the same answer. And then we take the partial with respect to x again. Oh, same thing we did over there. Okay, and hey, we got the same answer. And then we'll take the partial with respect to y. Hey, wait a minute. That's the same thing we did before. Ah, oh, could have saved myself a lot of work here. Because the f x x y is exactly partial cubed f over partial y partial x squared. And so all I really needed to do was take what I had already found and take the partial with respect to y of that. And when I take the partial with respect to y, 
Well, the derivative of sine is cosine. Then take the uh, partial derivative with respect to y of the inside, which would be 3, and that gives me 36 cosine 2x plus 3y. So now, what are partial differential equations? They have nothing to hide. They are equations that contain partial derivatives. It's exactly what the statement says. So a famous one would be Laplace's equation, which can be used in electromagnetics and fluid flow. And it just says, oh, the sum of the repeated partials has to equal zero. OK. So let's do an example where we have given the function u as being e to the x times sine y, and we want to show that's a solution to Laplace's equation. So all we need to do is find the repeated partials and show that they add up to 0. So the first partial with respect to x, well, the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. The sine of y is considered a a multiplicative constant, so you just get e to the x sine of y. And in fact, it doesn't matter how many times you take that partial with respect to x, you're just going to get e to the x sine of y. Now, when I take the partial with respect to y, uh, the e to the x is considered a constant, so the derivative of sine is cosine. Take the partial with respect to y again, now the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so now I have a negative sine, which is good. We want a negative sign because the rest of it looks like the second partial with respect to x. And so when I add these two together, I get zero. So it satisfies Laplace's equation. Let's do another example. Here we have kind of a... Uh, slightly different type of function. It's a polynomial. And we have x minus a t. a is a constant. x minus a t to the power of 5 plus quantity x plus a t to the power of 6. And we'd like to show that that is a solution to the wave equation. Now the wave equation looks an awful lot like Laplace's equation, but now we have this constant multiplier a squared. So our strategy is going to be the same. We're going to find the repeated partial with respect to t and the repeated partial with respect to x, and then just show that the repeated partial with respect to t is just a squared times the repeated partial with respect to x. So first derivative with respect to t, I'm going to use the power rule then I have to use the chain rule and be careful because the partial with respect to t of my first term is going to be negative at. The second term will just be a. So cleaning that up a little bit, bringing the multipliers out in front. Now I uh, use the power rule again and apply the chain rule. And you can see where the a squared is going to come from now. When I apply the chain rule again, in the first term, I get another multiplier of negative a. And in the second term, I get another multiplier of a. So the negative times the negative in the first term will give me a positive a squared. And then I'll get a positive a squared in the second term as well. So I have a common factor of a squared. That is looking good then. Uh, the partial with respect to x is simpler because the when I apply the chain rule, the derivative of the inside, the partial derivative with respect to x is just 1. So I just use the power rule twice. And sure enough, if I take the factor of a squared out of my second repeated deri partial derivative with respect to t, what's left inside the brackets is exactly uxx. And so we've shown that this particular function satisfies the wave equation. So for our last example, we're actually going to do some anti-partial differentiation because we are given two first-order partial derivatives and we're asked 
does there exist a function which could possibly have those first order partial derivatives? I mean, the same function f, having the, both of those partial derivatives. So what we're going to do is start with our partial derivative with respect to x and anti-differentiate with respect to x. So I'll get 1 half x squared. Then for y, we're considering a constant. So the antiderivative of a constant with respect to x would just be 4yx. But I like to write the variables in order. And then what's really different here is that I don't have a constant of integration, but a function which would be considered a constant when you're differentiating uh, with respect to x. And I see I have a, a typo. There we go. Fix that up. Since any function which contains y only would be considered a constant when I'm differentiating with respect to x, so I need the partial derivative with respect to x, I could have any function which only contains y in here. So that would be a possibility. And let me fix my typo. Because we're going to see the same thing happening here. We're going to anti-differentiate the first derivative with respect to y. We're going to anti-differentiate partial anti-differentiate with respect to y, which would mean what? Well, 3x would be a constant, so I'd get a 3xy and then minus 1 half y squared. And then, of course, we're going to add in, well, not a plus c, but a uh, function of x, any function of x only. So the idea would be, I need to be able to find, if I want to, to say that such an f of x exists, which has these first order partial derivatives, I would need to find a function g of y and a function h of x in order to make these two statements equal to each other. But we've got a problem. If the difference were only in terms that contain x only or y only, we would have a chance. But the difference in this case is in these terms that have uh, both x and y. So it doesn't really matter. We can choose any function of y we want, any function of x, but it's because it has to be a function of x only and not contain y. And this has to be a function of y only and not contain x. Then there's no way I can make the 4xy match the 3xy. And so our answer is no. There is no such function. We'll look at this type of problem uh, as we proceed into chapter 16.